Now, without further delay, we are ready to welcome our keynote speaker. Please roll the video. I'm a person that looks forward more than looks back. When I started 50 years ago as an entrepreneur, the word entrepreneur I don't think existed. The airline's the brainchild of Richard Branson, 34-year-old millionaire head of the Virgin Records empire. I think an entrepreneur is somebody that creates something that makes a positive difference to other people's lives. I'm a born optimist, you know, very positive person. Both my children have inherited that from me. And I was very lucky, I had a very happy childhood. One of the things I enjoy the most is teaching people to swim. Now, you shouldn't sink, Archbishop. You just go. I find it quite an easy thing to do, and it's wonderfully satisfying to help them stand on their own two feet. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Why do you have so much money? <laughs> the exciting thing about learning to be an entrepreneur is then later on in life, you can be creating not-for-profit businesses, not-for-profit things to try to deal with the problems of the world. I've been lucky enough to you know, help create The Elders, which is a wonderful group of people that are trying to tackle conflict resolution issues in the world. The Elders can become a fiercely independent and robust force for good. The Oceanic Elders to try to tackle the problems of the oceans. The Carbon Warum to try to tackle climate change. My attitude in life is to give everything I can to solve the problem. You know, trying to go to space has been tough, very tough. You know, the old saying, it's not rocket science. Well, obviously, if you're trying to go to space, it is rocket science. Armed. Armed. I get enormous satisfaction trying to achieve something that has never been achieved before. My favorite phrase to all, all the people around me is, screw it, just get on and do it. We don't have uh, virgin water. I don't know why we don't this morning, but... Actually, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> we will, um, <laughs> we will we'll, we'll get that sorted for next well, so time. Richard, thank you uh, for coming. We really appreciate your willingness to fly all the way across the ocean to join us this morning. And uh, I, this is an airspace and cyber conference. I think that means that a lot of people would like to know about space. Uh, and I noticed in your bio that you have been working space for a very long time. Tell us about how you got involved well, first of all, it's a great honor to be here, and thank you for the invite. Um, the, um, uh, so, uh, the first time uh, space really captivated me was when I was about 17 years old and um, watched, watched the moon landing. Um, I think maybe the two of us um, were old enough to remember it, and it was on a little, little black and white <laughs> TV set. Um, and, uh, and I thought, I'll be going to space one day. How, you know, this is something really to look forward to. Um, anyway, decade by decade went along, and uh, I then got a call from President Gorbachev, who was uh, trying to reach out to the rest of the world from Russia, inviting me to go to space on one of his spaceships. Um, and, of course, I immediately said yes. Um, but then his minions... Um, made it clear it was a $50 million check. <laughs> uh, so um, I decided to drop, drop that idea. Um, and then I um, started heading around the world to see if we could find some genius engineers to um, build, build spaceships. Um, 
uh, to enable myself and I believe most people if, if, um, would, love to, would love the chance to go to space if, we, if they could afford it. Um, and, um, and I came across somebody called Bert Rutan, who um, is one of those a aviation engineering geniuses. And, uh, uh, and we got involved um, with Spaceship One, with, with him and uh, Paul Allen. Um, and now we, we, we've, we've had an incredible year. We've, we've had um, you know, five people into space this year. Uh, five, five new astronauts created, which is the first new astronauts created since 2009. Um, and um, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been very exciting. I'll just, we might just show a quick video of where we are with Virgin Galactic, if that's all right. That'd be great, thank you. The exploration of space will go ahead. And it is one of the great adventures of all time. Spaceship Unity, welcome to space. Jaffe Page, billion dollar view. Humans have managed to learn so much about the universe in such a relatively small time frame compared with the life of the universe. That was always very incredible to me. Armed. Fire. Our mission is to lower the barrier to getting into orbit so that businesses and entrepreneurs, universities and countries can bring capabilities into space that help us here on Earth. As a species, we've traveled around our planet at the same speed for the last 50 to 60 years. You know, Spaceship Two is going to be the first space plane that on a regular basis flies humans faster than three times the speed of sound by bringing hundreds and eventually thousands of people into space. They'll get a different perspective on life and on our future. That will have a profound impact on how humanity faces its toughest problems. Together, we can make space accessible in a way that has only been dreamt of before now. And by doing that, we can truly bring positive change to life on Earth. I'd love to go into space. I think there could be, could be nothing nicer. So if you're building a spacecraft, I'd love to come with you on it. So, so uh, are you planning to fly yourself soon? <laughs> um, I, I absolutely would. Um, uh, I'm planning to fly myself, yes. <laughs> um, they, um, and it, it won't be long now. We're just moving the whole operation to New Mexico, where um, they built a beautiful spaceport there. Um, and we'll do a few more, a few more final test flights, and then, um, and then I'll go up, and then, um, uh, and then, you know, we've got about 700 people who've signed up to go up with us. We'll start, start putting them up. How many people in the audience would like to go to space one day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't surprised. Wasn't surprised in this <laughs> particular audience. Um, but bring, um, bring your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, our challenge is to get the price down to a level that people, you know, can save up, save up to do it, or maybe fly lots of times from Virgin Atlantic and get the frequent flyer program to do it. <laughs> uh, they, they, um, uh, so, um, uh, and the more spaceships we build, the, the more, the more we build to bring the price down. And, you know, interestingly, you know, when people cross the Atlantic in, in the 1920s, um, the price was about the same as it is to put somebody into space today on Virgin Galactic. Um, but, you know, decade by decade, the price came down. So now, you know, a lot of people can afford to fly across the Atlantic and want to do the same if possible. So, you know, one of the things that uh, I find interesting is that you uh, actually started Virgin Galactic, I think, in around 2003 or four, and now it's uh, 2019. What have been the struggles to get from where you were to where you are today? 
Well, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in that, in that introduction film, um, space is difficult um, and, uh, and much more difficult than I thought <laughs> when I started in 2003. I, I didn't expect to be uh, sitting here today saying, you know, we're about to go to space. I thought we would have gone a few years ago. Um, but, uh, um, you know, and so first of all, building, building rockets that are 100% safe, that you can um, just use time and time and time again and know that you're not going to have an incident. Um, obviously, building a mothership to take the spaceship up. Um, so we, we built the lar largest carbon composite plane uh, ever built, um, our mothership Eve, uh, to carry, carry this spaceship up to um, 40,000 feet before we released it. Um, the spaceship itself, I mean, it's got to withstand, um, you know, three and a half thousand miles, um, three and a half thousand miles per hour in um, uh, less than eight seconds. <coughs> and, and so again, it's got to be strong um, and, and capable of, of um, uh, go, you know, going 60 or 70 miles into space. Um, uh, so, um, and then you've got to have, you have brave test pilots who uh, have to try to find out what could go wrong um, uh, in space um, that you can't really test on the ground. Um, and in the process, we actually lost um, one pilot um, who made a tiny, tiny error, but we've, we've now made sure that the spaceship can't make that tiny error. Um, and. Um, and of course, you know that sets things back enormously. And, and um, um, but uh, yeah, but it, uh, um, I, we're, we're now at an, an exciting time. So when do you uh, take off in your, your spaceship? To how, how long do you actually get to be in space? So the whole round trip is about three hours. Um, if we one day we'll we'll extend it into you know, putting people into orbit, but the, the price then goes up dramatically. So. Um, what, what, we, what we think is that the, you know, the people want to become astronauts, they want to be able to uh, look back at the Earth in, in massive big windows, they want to be able to float around, um, uh, you know, they want to go into space. And, um, and the, the experience, uh, you know, the, the extra cost of putting somebody into orbit, um, we think is not, is most likely won't, you know, won't, won't be economical. Um, so, so I think we've got I think we've got the right um, the right the right balance and uh, and maybe one day, sir, with your uh, your knee that you've just pulled, we could um, get you to float around. You wouldn't have to worry about the knee. <laughs> it might be a lot easier. So do you, uh, a number of people talked about uh, sending people from uh, New York to Paris through space? Uh, is that economically feasible? Have you looked at that? Uh, I think it is, um, and once we've finish this program, we, we're going to be working hard on, uh, on that as an option. Um, and there are one or two other companies, in fact, I think there's one in, in the room today, um, who are seriously, um, seriously looking at, um, uh, well, at at least sort of five times the, 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 the um, speed of sound. Um, obviously, if you actually go into orbit, you're talking about traveling at 18 and a half thousand miles an hour and you can get anywhere in the world uh, in an hour. Uh, and the only problem is going to be the airport, getting through the airport on uh, both ends. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you parachute out. Right, have you uh, experienced our TSA yet? <laughs> um, I think we've, we've all experienced that. <laughs> so let's, uh, let me, before we uh, continue, let me mention we have microphones in the aisles. Uh, Sir Richard has said he'd be happy to take questions we want to talk for a bit longer, but if you'd like to ask a question, if you want to queue up behind the uh, microphones, I'm trying to be British today, queue up, and uh, we'd be happy to take some questions. So why don't, if you have them, why don't you start doing that, and we'll chat a little bit more about satellites. Uh, we've talked a bit about people. You know, one of the things that worries the uh, Defense Department a lot is the Chinese uh, ability and the Russian ability to shoot satellites out of the orbit or to disable them in various ways. Uh, and one of the responses this is, uh, is responsive launch, which you are working with Virgin Orbit. Let's talk a bit about Virgin Orbit. How did you get into that, and where do you see that going? So um, our thinking behind uh, Virgin Orbit 
um, uh, was that um, at present, if you want to put a satellite into space um, and you're in America, uh, there are two, two places you can launch from. And, and generally speaking, it takes about six months to eight months to get a, to get a slot. Um, and obviously, having only two places, it's, it's, it's quite vulnerable to attack as well. Um, so, uh, so our thinking with Virgin Orbit was, first of all, um, let's uh, use Virgin Orbit to put a, a big array of satellites around the world to connect the four billion people who are not connected. Um, and uh, and with, with low Earth orbit satellites, they fall out of the sky every four or five years. So the fact that we can uh, take off um, and launch a new satellite within 24 hours of a sat satellite falling out means there need be almost no disruption to a network. Um, the, the second thing is, um, from um, a military point of view, um, it, is that I mean, sh were, you know, were there to be a conflict in the Middle East and somebody knocked out all the satellites um, in, in that area. Um, by having a 747, which we, w w which we use, um, it's actually uh, called Cosmic Girl, and it was uh, Cosmic Girl when it flew for Virgin Atlantic once, and so uh, quite appropriate. We took it out of Virgin Atlantic and put, put it into Virgin Orbit. Um, and, um, but, but by having a 747 that can just take off um, at you know, f uh, four or five hours notice, um, have a rocket attached under the wing, uh, drop it and, and put, it, put, put a new satellite into space. Hopefully, it'll be a deterrent um, to, to um, an, an, an enemy state uh, to, um, to knock out um, satellites in the first place if they know that um, America or Great Britain has the capability of um, replacing satellites um, with it within 24 hours. Ho hopefully, you, will, you, you won't get the sort of uh, cyber war in space that we all fear. Um, and obviously space is critical to uh, communications um, and um, uh, so, uh, so we've been working for many years um, developing the, uh, Virgin Orbit. Um, we had our first drop test of a, a rocket um, a couple of months ago, um, which I'll show you in a second. And um, and in about uh, six weeks, eight weeks, um, we will be firing, uh, firing the engines on the next drop test um, and heading at 18,500 miles an hour around, around the Earth in orbit, um, beginning to drop off satellites. Um, so, so for both Virgin Galactic and Virgin Orbit, it's an exciting time. But I'll just give people an, a, a quick look at Virgin Orbit. And, Cosmic Girl at one orbit base, we have lock on Long, Long Beach and Mojave. Orbit base, TD, we are turning up with the cold pass, leveling off at flight level 300. Are you ready to commit to terminal count? Yes, MCC is go for terminal count. LE1, are you go for terminal count? Okay, we are go for terminal count. LE2, please proceed through terminal count. Orbit base LE-1 rocket is now on internal power. Yeah, Orbit base LE-1, uh, we just pushed into drop rest mode. Uh, currently, estimating 1650 flat for drop time. And for all operators, Cosmic Girl was on the northern leg of its hot pass. Approximately 40 seconds. All operators, Cosmic Girls is making its final turn into the southern drop leg. Arm, only in three, two, one, bell. Be advised, we have released. Control room, this is LD. We do have a report of a clean release.
So, thank you very much. Yeah, so the, the, you know, the, the good thing is that 747s, believe it or not, do not cost um, very much these days. <laughs> um, and, um, it's like a B-52. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> I've, rung, I've rung up Boeing twice in my life, and um, 35 years ago, I'd just been bumped off a plane going to the, um, uh, to the Virgin Islands, and, um, uh, uh, and they said the plane wasn't full enough, and therefore they wouldn't take me there. And I'd been away from my girlfriend for three weeks. I was 27 years old, and I was absolutely determined to get there. Um, so I, so I, hired a, I hired a plane, um, uh, got a blackboard, and as a joke, I wrote Virgin Airlines one way, $39, um, uh, to the British Virgin Islands, and went around all the passengers who got bumped, and I sold out my first plane. Um, <laughs> and and um, the next day, I rang up Boeing, and, and, um, uh, and I tried to put on a, a deep-sounding a deep voice. Um, and said, um, do you have any second-hand 747s for sale? Um, and the person said, well, you know, what, what do you do? I said, um, uh, well, I run a record company. I've got the Rolling Stones. I've got the Sex Pistols. And, um, <laughs> and uh, there was a long pause, and I thought he was going to put the phone down on me. Um, and he said, look, I'll tell you what. I'll send a salesman along to see you um, as long as you make one promise. And I said, well, what is that? He said, um, that under no circumstances can you call the airline Virgin. He said, everyone will assume it's not going to go the whole way. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> 35 years ago, we, we did start with one plane from them. And, um, and then Virgin Orbit has started with one plane 35 years later. And, you know, what, what I think um, from... Uh, you know, working, you know, we've, we've had meetings with the U.S. Um, Air Force, with the British Air Force, with the Canadian Air Force, with the European Air Forces. And I think together, um, uh, you know, if, if there were, if it, you, know, one, you know, one day to maybe have eight different planes or something like that parked around the world with a, with a, um, a number of satellites, a number of rockets, um, a number of satellites. Um, and... Uh, um, and I think as long as, you know, as long as that, if that's done, I think the chances of us getting satellites not knocked out by an enemy power is very unlikely because we'll be able to get ours back up far quicker than they'll be able to get theirs back up. So one of the things, I, as I mentioned in the green room, I was one of the two guys who signed the contract for EEL, uh, EELV, our big launch program, the Air Force, thinking that commercial lift would pay for a lot of this. And then it disappeared and disappeared some more and never happened. And in part, you're dependent on commercial launch, I assume. So what, what is your sense of where are we really with the commercial market for small sats and launch? Oh, I think um, uh, we de the world desperately needs uh, big arrays of small satellites uh, to connect the sort of four and a half billion people who are not connected on the internet, for instance, because you know, if you're not connected on the internet, it's very difficult for you to compete with somebody who is connected on the internet, you know, whether it's health or education or, um, you know, or numerous other things. Um, Larry Page, I know quite well, who runs Google, who started Google, and I, I heard a kid ask him, um, so, so what, do, what do you do, Mr. Page? And uh, Larry responded, I help people find things. <laughs> um, and Google, Google has done that extre extremely well. Um, but... Um, uh, um, yeah, so um, um, I've lost my track. Anyway, okay. Why don't we ask, go to a question? I see some people standing down there. Why don't you ask a question? Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Good morning, sir Richard. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Winston Campbell, and I'm involved with a space camp in New Mexico, actually. We bring kids out to Spaceport America. We've done it for the last six years and really had a blast. And one of the things we talk to the kids about as we go to various sites is we tell them these are careers that you can have. You just got to work for it. You got to set your goals. You have to go after it. As Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit, you span your operations, you're going to need more talent, obviously, engineering, fabrication, but also more pilots. So my question to you is, what are your long-term plans to establish a pipeline and maintain a pipeline of pilots on boarding for your operations that we can turn our kids and say, look, this is kind of your path that you need to follow if you want to kind of get into that business? Are, are you pitching? <laughs> 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 uh, 
Uh, Doing it for the kids, sir. <laughs> they, um, uh, yeah, I mean, we, I, I, obviously, I don't think we'll have any shortage of people who'd, who would love to be um, uh, uh, pilots and astronauts with, with Virgin Galactic. Um, uh, but we, we ha you know, we are training a, a number to be able to cope with the first three, three spaceships that we've got. Um, and hopefully the demand will be such that we'll be, we, 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 we will be seeking um, yeah, more and more pilots. And I, I would hate to make your bosses to think I'll be poaching from this room, but, um, <laughs> but, I, but you know, you're, the, you're, the best in, you're the best in the world. So I think it's much more likely that, that um, well, maybe they'll lend us one or two, one, one or two in the years to come. Well, Thanks, but it's great. Yeah. I, maybe hopefully see you in New Mexico sometime. It's a beautiful spaceport, and it's great to see kids, um, you know, getting excited by this. Let's go to the other side of the room. That's you. Hi, that's me. All right. Uh, big fan of yours, uh, Sir Richard Branson. Uh, my wife is too, but I think it's for a different reason. Um, so, I, I follow you online and all of your t your tweets and your shares on LinkedIn about inclusion and the importance of people. And I wanted to know your vision because the Air Force has realized that people is what runs the service. So what do you do with Virgin to help inclusion and diversify your workforce? Um, it's a, a very important question. Um, and I, um, I'll go right back to when I was uh, seven or eight years old and um, uh, and if I said ill about somebody, my parents would send me to the mirror uh, and make me look into the mirror and just say, you know, you've got to stand there for 10 minutes, how, how badly it reflects on you. Um, and I think that kind of upbringing taught me uh, to always look for the best in people. Um, and, uh, and if you look for the best in people, you get, you get the best back. Um, and... Um, and, you know, so we've looked for leaders at Virgin that are great at praising people, uh, great at looking for the best in people, um, and, uh, and, 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 that's, and that's worked for Virgin. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's a uh, slightly overused uh, phrase by companies that um, to, run, to run a company like a family, but that's what we try to do at Virgin. And, and from what I've heard, I've, you know, the, the, the people who are running uh, uh, the U.S. Air Force are, you know, much more inclusive in that way, and they, 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 they seem to, it, it is, and hopefully that is, you know, ricocheting down through the, through the ranks. Um, because I think, you know, if you, if you have a happy, well-motivated group of people really, really proud of what they're doing, um, they can achieve anything, and, and, um, and, and it's very, very exciting. At Virgin, if we launch a new company, I mean, we're just going into the uh, cruise business uh, with something called Virgin Voyages, and um, you know, we can now we can draw on all, all the all the different parts of Virgin around the world, the best people, uh, and create something unique and special. Um, and I think in the Air Force, it's important that uh, you don't just get locked into silos. If there's if there's an exciting new project that people are pulled from, you know, uh, many different parts of um, the Air Force. Um, I'd love to get your opinion, but I would hate to get you into trouble. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you we go back to the other side. Um, good morning, Sir Richard. My name is Sydney Klucher, and I'm a JROTC cadet from Pensacola High School, and I hope to be an astronaut one day. So my question for you is, what qualities are you looking for that are most important to you and your astronauts and pilots? Um, yeah, I'm not necessarily the uh, the I, I would I, I, the best the best person to to um, uh, look at the qualities of what's needed to be an astronaut. Um, I've flown balloons around the world, uh, crashed crashed in oceans. Um, <laughs> I think I, I think I've got the, the, the world record for the, mo the most times pulled out of the sea um, by, heli <laughs> by helicopters. <laughs> Um, so I don't think the team would trust me in, in um, making astronaut <laughs> choices, um, you know. But um, you know, but I know. Look, they'll be looking for um, they'll, they'll be looking for people who've had an exemplary uh, career in in um, in the Air Force. Um, uh, they'll be 
um, I, I think char character reference is, is going to be critical. Um, uh, and um, uh, and one day, would, you, you should, if, you're, if I'm allowed to say it, you should apply, <laughs> go, and go along and meet our team. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Let's go back to the other side. Hello, sir. Thank you so much, first off, for taking the questions from the audience in the first place. My name is Jennifer, and I'm a reporter, an editor with Air Force Magazine. Um, and my question is, uh, by virtue of your experience with Virgin Group, making you somewhat of an artist at the idea of anticipating future challenges and future needs, and spinning off institutions, making them appear essentially out of the ether to meet those head on, what advice would you give to the military as it approaches the potential creation of a U.S. Space Force? Um, the, I mean, I think, I think that what you're doing already sound, I mean, I was just talking to uh, some of your generals, uh, as you do, <laughs> uh, in, in, uh, before coming on. And, um, you know, I think the, I, I, I think your sessions where you get you know, you get you get people in a room, and some some pretend to be the enemy. Some some um, uh, are representing the American Air Force, um, and you, and you're just brainstorming, 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 trying to come up with all all the potential eventualities that you need to address. And out of those sessions, hopefully, somebody will be um, writing down a list of things that they can learn from those sessions. Um, the key is, will, will, will people at the top act on them? Um, and, um, and at, you know, at Virgin, if I'm on a, you know, if I'm on a Virgin Atlantic airplane, I'll always have a notebook in my pocket, um, never to be too proud to pull it out and, and write down feedback from passengers or from staff. Um, so I think um, a good leader just has to be listening, listening, listening all the time. Um, writing things down and then and then acting on them, um, and um, and I think in that in that way your company or your air force can just get better and better and better. Thank you. We we'll take a couple more. I want to go back to the other side if we could. Sir, my name is Anthony Urbic and I work for the Ground Based Strategic Deterrent Program. Uh, my question is. We, we do have a number of companies in private industry that are pursuing space projects, and we do have funding on the government side. And I'm wondering if you see a balance there that makes the most sense compared to where we are now and where we've been in the past. So the question is about how much government do you, uh, he ought to fly? Yes, yes, sir. You know, what, what is the correct balance between government funding and industry projects? Is, do you see a balance, or is it continually evolving? So I think... Um, uh, private private industry can generally, I think, do things um, more cost-effectively um, than um, uh, than than government-run businesses. Um, uh, but um, private industry, you know, there are some things that private industry do that they, they very much need to work uh, work with government on, um, and. Um, yeah, so you know, with Virgin Orbit putting putting um, uh, you know, putting planes around the world and putting satellites and putting rockets there, um, you know, would not make sense for us as a private company, but working with, with government and maybe the, the, the um, US Air Force, um, you know, uh, we, can, we can both bring our individual skills to it and, and it makes sense. Um, and um, yeah, so I think, I think that there's a good working balance between the two. Um, NASA have effectively become an organization that, um, that farms out a lot of its work to private uh, enterprise um, uh, because they know that, that private enterprise are likely to do it more cost effectively than they can. Um, but they still keep a watchful eye on it. And, and some of the really big projects, you know, they, they, they still get involved with. By the way, one really exciting thing, who's seen this wonderful a new satellite uh, that looks just like Earth that's been discovered in the last two weeks. Um, and it's got water on it. It's just beautiful. But um, anybody seen it? I've seen pictures of it. Uh, one or two people. OK. Um, you, were, you should check it out on the internet. I mean, it's, it's like this beautiful Earth. It's just outside our solar system. Um, and a probe has, um, is, is, uh, has gone 
I mean, not, not that close, but they're going to send, NASA are going to send another probe to go really close to see if there's any life, life on it. But if there's water, it's quite possible that there is life on it. And, um, uh, and um, you know, and these are the sort of things that, you know, small, very small probes can discover in the future. Let me uh, follow up. And uh, are you seeing other governments interested in rapid launch as well, or is this really just a United States issue at this point? No, it, it, it's. I mean, the, the exciting thing I think is that, um, I mean, like, I mean, as far as the specific project we're talking about. And the British government got together with the, oh, sorry, the British Air Force got together with the American Air Force. Um, and, um, and they've also talked to the Canadians and the Europeans. And, you know, so we, we are going to be launching a satellite for, um, for, the, for, the, for uh, the, the US Air Force from Guam um, in the next few months. And, and we're going to be launching a satellite for, for the uh, UK um, Air Force from Cornwall in England, and that's the exciting thing. We can we can we can launch 3,000 miles apart. We can go into any orbit anywhere in the world, which is not possible for land land-based launches. So, um, the um, yeah, it's so exciting. So I think we have time for one more. I think I'm on this side. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Vanga Maradian from uh, Defense and Aerospace Report with uh, conference off to a tremendous start, Sir Richard. Uh, it's an honor uh, seeing you again. I uh, remember interviewing you many years ago at uh, Farnborough. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the nature and your thoughts on how to drive innovation? Few, few people have started as many things as you have, uh, aside, of course, from having been pulled out of the water uh, several times. It was in, uh, you know, always in the drive to achieve something that hadn't been achieved. As the military looks to figure out new and smarter ways of doing things, what do you think are the core elements of how to think about innovation and then execute it? Um, so most things that uh, Virgin has done have, have come out of a, uh, come out of sort of frus a frustration. Of, you know, I, I told the story about how we, why we started Virgin Atlantic, um, but that, you know, that, uh, that, that applies to most things we've done. We, we I mean, like in Amer here in America, um, uh, the, the train business, by and large, disappeared many years ago. The train tracks were um, were covered up, covered over by um, uh, by car, you know, by, by roads. Um, and uh, it's our belief that we can actually bring really exciting high-speed rail back to America and other places in the world. Um, and you know, so we've been developing something called Virgin Hyperloop. Um, which are um, trains that could go up to a thousand miles an hour uh, in a in a va in a vacuum in a tube, um, fl fl a magnetic floating on magnetic vacuum, um, and so what we'll do is we'll you know we, we 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 believe that's possible. We'll invest in you know one or two engineers. We'll maybe uh, on this on this case we we built a small track in outside Las Vegas, um, and. Um, yeah, we gave it a go, and um, and then we, you know, and, and so I think a lot a lot of these things is just trying things and not being afraid of failure, um, uh, and you know, occasionally falling flat in your face. Um, you need to be working for a company where the people above you, um, you know, do not uh, jump down your throat if you do fail. I mean, if you don't, you've got to be have a. a um, a company's got to be able to uh, accept failure as well as accept great things. And and um, but if you try, you know, ten ways of fixing something, one of those ten most, you know, it's quite likely to succeed. Um, I don't know if we've got time. Should we just show the Virgin Hyperloop? Yeah, video? we have it. Yeah. Going up to DevLoop for the first time was seeing just unbridled opportunity. You saw the desert completely bare, and you saw in your head, in your mind's eye, what we were going to put there. I felt really confident because I have a tremendous confidence in the people that I, I work with and the people on the team that, that I helped build. You've got teams from mechanical design, teams from computer engineering, and 
people who've worked on massive motor systems, massive rocket ships, and aerospace, aerodynamic engineering. This thing that started as a sketch and an idea and then lived on this computer is now real and it's welded and it's bolted and you can put your hands on it. And then we actually assemble all the parts onto it and set it up to site and you flip the power switch and it just comes to life. That's really the engineering dream to get to see that whole process through. We broke all Hyperloop speed records. And to think we did all this in 10 months. We proved to the whole world that we can build safely, quickly, efficiently, and prove the technology works. This is just the beginning. This company, like others in the Virgin family, has insatiable curiosity and the grit to get it done. I can't wait to see what we do next as a team. Well, one of the things that uh, Sir Richard told me is that you actually have to have a lot of fun doing this, that that's half the battle of innovation. And I know that he has a lot of fun on April Fool's Day. And I'd like to maybe perhaps end with a lighter note, April Fool's, tell us about April Fool's. <laughs> Um, yeah, April Fool's Day, I love, I love pulling people's legs and then occasionally they pull my leg, leg back. Um, and um, uh, and one of, one of, uh, every April Fool we come up with something quite fun. But, um, but anyway, one year um, we built a, spa a, spa uh, sorry, a, a yeah, spaceship. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and basically it was a U UFO, um, as you do. <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, and um, we, uh, um, we, we flew the UFO over, um, over London um, uh, and, uh, and the radio stations got on alert, uh, the army were called out, four police courses <laughs> were, were called out. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's the that's the uh, UFO up in up in the in the sky early early morning about four four thirty in the morning, and it had strobe lights and it you know just looked exactly like you'd imagine a UFO would look like. Um, went down the motorway, um, all every single car stopped, everybody got out of the car, um, the whole motorway came to a grinding halt, um, and uh, and then we realised we were heading for Gatwick Airport, which wasn't a very good idea. Um, <laughs> And um, so we, we managed to land in a foggy field just outside Gatwick. Um, the army surrounded the field. Um, <laughs> the, the police surrounded the field. Um, we were looking out of a little, little hole in, in, in the UFO, <laughs> and we saw this English bobby with a truncheon walking towards us. And, um, and I must admit, I smiled thinking, you know, this is the first thing that somebody from outer space is going to see as an English policeman with a, with a tru <laughs> truncheon. <laughs> Anyway, we had this door that, 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 that just like an E.T., it opened very slowly. And we, and, and we pumped all this dry ice in, in, inside the... And, and, um, uh, and I, the, the person that ran our, our record company in America um, happened to be uh, about this height. And so we had an E.T. outfit on him. <laughs> and, and he walked down the steps very slowly, and, and this policeman just turned and ran. <laughs> and uh, anyway, there he is. <laughs> but, uh, so it was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Sir Richard, we, uh, we puzzled about what can you give a multi-billionaire that he doesn't already have, and we came up with our famous Air Force Association socks. As you'll find here in the Defense Department, at least one major buyer for the Air Force <laughs> really loves his socks. So let me... <laughs> I hope they fit. <laughs> ah, perfect. I'll put the other one on when I get out. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you.